Hello everybody, John here, and today on To The Garage, we're looking at the top 10 things I love most about XK8 ownership. If you're new to the channel, then welcome. We cover all manner of subjects relating to mending, making, reviewing, tinkering with cars, bits and pieces in your garage. So that sounds like your bag, then please support the channel by subscribing and click on the bell icon so we can give you notification of new videos coming up. And talking of videos, we have over 200 already available for you to view. We have all manner of vehicles in the fleet and all manner of subjects that we cover. I started thinking about this list because getting on for a year ago, I sold my previous XK8 after about uh, 12 years of ownership and immediately bought another one. And somebody was asking me, why, why didn't you consider all the other options open to you? You know, why just go for the same? And that turned into this list. The list is much longer than that I'm going to share with you. I've narrowed it down to 10. And I'm going to show you this probably over the course of uh, three videos. Just because, interested in your thoughts, have I got the right 10? Are they in the right order? And before I get there, what do you predict will be the top three? Let's jump straight in. So, at number 10, I have practicality. Doesn't sound too sexy. What do we mean? This is obviously a hobby car, a toy car, something that's very much about heart as much as it is head. But what I've not done is bought a Lamborghini Espada that will break down every five minutes. A Morgan three-wheeler that you have to be shoehorned into and you can't take anything with you and barely any body with you. This is an eminently practical vehicle. It's a fabulous vehicle in every heart way, but in a headway, this is a car that can be used, and I do use. It's not my only vehicle. I don't clock up miles in it for no apparent reason, but my wife can take her dad off to the supermarket in it and wouldn't think twice about jumping in it to use because it's not that strange or unwieldy or scary to use. Um, we can take it anywhere, do anything. It's a lovely vehicle to be in. Uh, it's a functional thing as well as it is an aesthetically pleasing and just emotively very pleasing vehicle. And despite being a 20 year old, at the time quite exotic convertible, I'm not worried about security on it either. It's decent. It does have back seats. Yes, they're more for children. Uh, you definitely though do get the advantage of being able to use it for luggage space. The space in the back, you know, realistically, there is no leg room unless you are properly, properly tiny. Um, and you know, with kids stopping in child seats, they by the time their legs are dangling down there, they're probably too big anyway. If you've got a coupe, the backrest is slightly more reclined. It's you know, they are usable as an occasional seat for a sideways adult or more luggage, but you can just take it off for a drive anywhere, it's normal. In the convertible, you have a large area behind the seats, but if you are driving with a hood up. You've got extra storage. Um, unlike uh, hardtop convertibles, the hood does not fold up into the boot, and you have an enormous boot. Again, slight differences between coupe and convertible. In this regard, the coupe is actually slightly harder to access the boot, but uh, both are huge. In at nine, I've got value for money. So this is a vehicle that would have cost around about £65,000 when new. If you wanted to buy something today that had similar attributes, you'd certainly be up at that price and beyond new. It's a car which, because it has genuine classic status, because of its age, it's actually cheap to insure. Me, as a grown-up in the UK, fully comp with my wife, we spend 
maybe 120, 130 pounds a year to ensure this fully comprehensively on 6,000 miles. Unlike some ways I could have spent my money, this is not just a car to ring back to number uh, 10 on my chart that you just take to shows. You can literally take it out for a nice drive on a nice day or go to the shops in it or go to work in it. So it is a car. You genuinely are getting value for money there. You can get the convertible. You get all the wood and the leather and the toys and the looks all for a very reasonable price. Parts availability is pretty good. No, they're not Ford and Vauxhall prices, but equally they're not Mercedes and Ferrari prices. These are usable, practical cars which you can afford to run if you can afford a second car. At the time of writing, this is 2020, uh, they are just beginning to hit the upward curve for price, so be aware of that. But you can easily buy a coupe for five to ten thousand pounds. You can easily buy a convertible for seven to fifteen thousand pounds, and XKRs command another fifteen hundred to two thousand on top. And there's a huge range in between that. But we're not talking absolutely astronomical amounts of money and what would I get if I spent elsewhere if I wanted to go for the same British emotive content then I could get a DB7 the sister car to the XK8 beautiful great badge great heritage fabulous engine but empirically not as good a car it is not as reliable. You can't get the parts as easily. The cost of ownership will be significantly higher. And it is not as nice to drive in many, many ways. So, yeah, you can pick up a DB7. That's going to cost you for a coupe in high teens, if you're very lucky, into mid-twenties for a decent example. And that would tickle a lot of my... Uh, desires but I've driven one it's not as nice the mini British icon fabulous fun great toy car one to own one in my garage wish I'd put one away years ago the one in the picture is 65,000 pounds yes it's a Cooper S but you know I'd want the sporty one and it's a nice example and all the rest of it but that's not off the charts for one of these things you're certainly going to be spending 20000 plus to buy a really nice, early, genuine, um, sporty Mini. So, am I going to put my money there when I can have a drop-dead gorgeous GT convertible? I don't think so. And then we come to the car which most of us believe we would swap our XK8s for. And that's an E-Type. And yes... The E-Type is drop-dead gorgeous. It is the original British GT supercar icon. It's the Jaguar people think of when they talk about Jaguars, really. I've driven an E-Type. I know lots of people I meet at shows who've got them. They are gorgeous to look at and lovely to talk about. Actually, I don't know if I would want to buy one because of value for money. They are going to cost you sixty to a hundred thousand pounds, and then some more, depending on where it is. And in today's uh, roads, not as usable, not as good a car. So I'm going to stick with the XK8 because of value for money. If I take British and iconic out of the equation there are three other sensible alternatives BMW 8 series actually did consider getting one of these gorgeous but quirky looking really expensive to keep on the road Porsche the front engine V8s and 928s again brilliant car love the performance quite like the look a little bit dumpy parts prices getting really quite silly 
and the Mercedes SLs. Um, very finely engineered cars. I think the looks are a little frumpy. It looks too much like they've taken their current saloon and turned it into their GT and their hood is awful. But at least it has a hood and I can't spend any amount of money to get the other two as a convertible. Again, value for money, XK8. So I think that if you want a GT convertible car that is fun, fast and usable, then you cannot really look too much further than the X100 series of Jaguars, the XK8 and the XKR. They are eminently usable vehicles that are available, that are going up in price. There are experts out there acting as independents who can help you keep them on the road. They are 4 litre V8s, but old enough that in the UK the road tax is not uh, astronomical. They are insurable because they are treated as classics, as they well should be. Um, and the fuel economy, despite the V8 engine, is not off the charts stupid. You can do something with it. So, I think the XK8 is fantastic value for money. At number 8, I've got something very specific. I'd love to say it's just outright performance, but it's not. There are faster cars out there. The XKA, XKR are very quick, but it's the way they do it. It's the torque curve. The XKA, XKR have the beautiful Jaguar V8 engine. And that's been evolved over years, but it goes from 4 litre up till nowadays 5 litres in the later XKs. And they all share a brilliant characteristic. Yes, it comes along with the V8 territory, but the Jaguar V8 is pretty extreme in this regard. The engine delivers 80% of its maximum torque across a huge range of revs. Basically, the entire usable rev range from 2000 up to 6000 RPM. People often say, oh, such a such an engine, a turbo or a VTEC, comes on song at a particular revs and it's amazing. The XK, it's the opposite. It never comes on song, it's permanently on song. Normally aspirated, instant throttle response, supercharged, none of the lag of the turbocharger. They are train-like in their power delivery. And that's why, despite being a car with huge acceleration, great horsepower, fabulous top speed, I'm actually putting the torque curve in at number eight. At seven, I'm having the convertible roof. Now, this is not going to be applicable to some of you folk, but for me, my toy car, my hobby car, has to be a convertible. Bizarrely, it's something very British. We don't get five minutes of sunshine before the next rainstorm. And I think we have this anxiety about having to have the roof off um, every possible great minute. But for me, a sports car or a GT car needs its roof to come off. There are lots of fabulous cars out there that have not got convertible tops. And I probably want to own them all. But for me, the roof is an important part of the equation. So... On the XK8, the roof looks great. That's the first thing to say. That is not the case in all cars. The next is it's quite modern. So my cars are uh, were, I should say, 21 and 22 years old at the points of owning. And the roof was never, ever a compromise or felt old. They are electrically operated, hydraulically driven. 
um, very elegant, almost silent in operation. They can be worked from inside the car and outside of the car and are one touch. You do not need to release any clips or catches or anything like that. You can press the button on the dashboard and it will fold up or you can use the key in the door. A negative for some is the tono. So it doesn't cover itself in a way many hard tops do. Um, you need to put on a lever tono or leverette tono to cover it so that the interior of the headliner doesn't get uh, degraded by the sun and covered in road dirt and all the rest of it. But the positive of that is you get that classic good look of a car with that leather deck at the back. Um, only really surpassed by things like Bentleys and Rolls Royces which might have a planked deck over their hoods. So this bit is rather manual. But that's for me the only negative of this hood. I would go as far as to say but I'm unaware of a better soft top convertible hood on any car at any price point of this era up till today. It is literally uncompromised. Um, we have pillarless doors which are often a, a barrier to really good soft top roofs but not an XK8. Look at that. A lowerable rear quarter lights and you can play around with all sorts of great combinations for ventilation and look with your car. What's not to love? It seals well, it doesn't leak, it has gutters over the windows and the wind noise is negligible with it up. It isn't much different to the coupe in terms of the driving experience in a convertible. Even the scuttle shake, which is often quoted as the misguided uh, element connected with buying a convertible, is negligible on an XK8. It may have helped that the roof is identical to the DB7, Aston Martin, and therefore the roof was developed with going on an Aston Martin being in mind right back there in 96. Being a convertible and being beautiful do not necessarily go hand in hand. I'd like to deploy this picture. Um, this is a Vauxhall Cavalier Commander. Um, this is Vauxhall's attempt at making a Cavalier into a convertible. That hood is not broken. That's how they came. It was horrible. But then again, paying lots of money is no guarantee of styling excellence either. Check out the BMW 6 Series Convertible. A really expensive car. That, in my mind, I didn't even get the right boot lid for. But Jeremy Clarkson famously described this car's hood as like a tramp's hat. And I can't agree more. I, I just don't know what they were thinking. And just to be completely fair, let's look at an even more expensive car from the same era as the XK8, but was a direct competitor, the Mercedes SL. This is a car that has got quality exuding from every pore, but check out the hood. It does not match the styling of the car. It does not look well finished. It doesn't really meet in a lot of places. I've seen plenty of these at the side of the road. I'm sure they keep the water out, but there's even the white stitching on these things. What were they thinking? Well, at risk of being called a tease, I'm going to draw a line under this one for now because I need to get out and do some work on one of the campers. But hopefully you've enjoyed this and you're going to give me your comments as to what you think will be in the top three. I've already written them down, so I'm not going to change them, but I will reference what people have said. So I look forward to seeing you again on To The Garage real soon. Please subscribe. <laughs>